Hey everybody, what's going on? Dustin here with another documentary video. Now today we are picking up where we left off. This is part th 3 of the SS Normandy series. If you have not watched parts 1 and 2, feel free to watch those. I will link those down in the description below. Or you can click on the card on the top corner of your screen as well. So, in this part we're going to be discussing about World War II and the uh, conversion of the SS Normandy from being... A popular French vessel to a what well, she would have been a troop ship. From where we last left off, the Normandy completed her 139th and final voyage on August 28th in 1939. No one knew at the time it would be her last time crossing the Atlantic Ocean as the ship is mothballed by the CGT at Pier 88. Any possible rivalry with the RMS Queen Mary and a proposed sister ship, the SS Britannia, was quickly dashed on September 1st of 1939 when German forces entered Poland and quickly Britain and France declared war on Germany, thus igniting World War II. For six years, this is one of the most deadliest conflicts, resulting in 70 to 85 million fatalities on both military and civilian casualties. This war actually developed better advanced weaponry, technology, and even ships bigger, faster, and more resilient to firepower. Even World War II saw a new weapon that could wipe the city off the map, and it was done twice in Japan by the United States of America. But however, as the Second World War raged on and the casualties were piling up, the Normandy was actually still in New York's harbor Pier 88 as a federal government interned the ship at the time France declared war on Germany just two days later. So you're possibly wondering what is internment? Internment is an imprisonment of people which is commonly in large groups without charges or intent to file any charges. It tends to refer to preventive confinement rather than confinement after having been convicted of a crime. So in this case the SS Normandy right here is actually interned by the federal government and keep the ship from being into enemy's hands or be involved in a war that they did not want to be a part of. A perfect example of internment is basically the Japanese Americans that were sent to internment camps after the attack on Pearl Harbor in order to you know prevent any spies or anyone attacking the country from within. But however, her rivals the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth were actually later refitted into troop ships and for five Five months, all three of these were actually tied side by side with each other, and can you just imagine seeing these three massive ships all together in person? I would just be amazed and surprised by the size of all of them. And then, of course, after those five months, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth would later be converted into troop ships and later sent back to Europe. So thus leaving the SS Normandy behind moored at Pier 88. On May 15th, 1940, during the Battle of France, U.S. Treasury Department detailed 150 agents of the U.S. Coast Guard to go aboard the Normandy and Manhattan's Pier 88 to defend it against any possible sabotage. Now keep this in mind though, the U.S. mandated a law saying that the Coast Guard was a part of the Treasury during peacetime. And then, June 1940, France fell to Germany. Once became the City of Light, now descended into darkness and the ship remained in U.S. Coast Guard custody. Then on November 1st of 1941, the Normandy's U.S. Coast Guard detail actually remained intact when the Coast Guard was actually became a part of the United States Navy. So therefore their duties actually are observing the French crew, maintaining the boilers and machinery and other equipment including the firewatch system on board. So keep in mind, the ship actually does have a pretty effective firewatch system before its conversion. However, on December 7th of 1941, the Imperial Japanese Navy launched a surprise air attack on Pearl Harbor on the island of Oahu in Hawaii, sinking and damaging the Pacific Fleet and killing 2,403 military personnel and civilians. The following day in a joint session in Congress, 
President Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared war on Japan to which his colleagues obliged. However, my good friend says from History Inside Nutshell did a full video on the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor to which I will include a card on the top corner of the screen for you guys to check out as well and also a link down in the description below. After America declared war on Japan and Germany, the world is now at its knees on both sides of the theaters, both the Pacific and Europe. The demand for tonnage of troop ships is right now at its highest. Then the Coast Guard actually removed Captain Lehun and his crew took possession of the Normandy under the right of Angari, maintaining steam in the boilers and other activities on the now idle vessel. So the firewatch system which ensures that any fire would be suppressed before it becomes a danger and a threat was abandoned. Now keep in mind though, this is actually coming to fair play. That firewatch system being abandoned, that's going to come into play. And you're possibly going to be wondering, what is an Angari? So an Angari is actually a belligerent to seize and use for the purposes of war or to prevent the enemy from doing so. So therefore, any kind of property or on belligerent pro property, including what would be sub belong subject or citizens of a neutral state. Like, therefore, the SS Normandy is basically in a neutral state, which is basically the United States of America. And the United States Navy seized the ship and used it for use the purpose of Angari. Now, some of you are going to be asking, ain't that what requisition is supposed to be? There's actually two different meanings for it. What the United States Navy did to the Normandy is Angari. However, requisition is a different meaning. However, requisition is just basically going to the company, you know, letting them know, hey, we're going to need your vessel to be requisitioned for a purpose of war and we will uh, basically pay you after we're done with it. So and a perfect example would be the Admiralty which requisitioned not only the HMHS Britannic we used for war but also its sister ship the HNT Olympic to be converted into a troop ship. Also perfect examples also include the the Mauritania being converted from its auxiliary class into a troop ship or a hospital ship and the Aquitania vice versa and of course the Admiralty actually did pay both companies to use their vessels as well so then the auxiliary vessels board actually recorded Franklin D Roosevelt's approval on the Normandy to be transferred to the US Navy as plans call for the ship to be turned into a convoy unit loaded transport carrier or a troop ship so the Navy actually renamed the Normandy into the USS Lafayette in honor of both General Marcus de Lafayette, who is a French general who fought on the colony's behalf in the American Revolution, and the alliance with France that made American independence possible. The name was a suggestion of J.P. Warburg, who is the advisory assistant to Colonel William J. Donovan, who is the coordinator of information which was passed through multiple channels including the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Harold R. Stark, and Chief of the Bureau of Navigation, Rear Admiral Randall Jacobs. The name Lafayette was officially approved by the Secretary of the Navy on December 31st of 1941. However, there's also proposals that included turning the Lafayette into an aircraft carrier, but this was actually dropped in favor due to immediate troop transport whatsoever. So therefore, the Normandy actually stayed in Pier 88 for conversion. Like for a ship this size should be in a dry dock, but unfortunately, I don't think there's any dry dock that's actually big enough to take up this ship. The only one that would take up is basically all the way out in France, but therefore around that time, France was already occupied by the Germans. So after the name Lafayette was actually approved, work actually went underway to convert the Normandy into a troop ship. So a contract for her conver conversion was actually awarded to Robbins Dry Dock and Repair Company, which is a subsidiary of Todd Shipyards, on December 27th of 1941. Captain Clayton M. Simmers, who is the 3rd Naval District Material Officer, reported to the Bureau of Ships his estimate that the conversion would actually be complete by the end of January 1942. Captain Robert G. Coleman actually reported as Lafayette's prospective commanding officer, who oversees a skeleton engineering force numbering of 458 men. However, the sheer size of the ship actually did prevent the Coleman's crew from adhering to the original schedule. But however, the familiarization with the vessel was also an issue as well, because 
you have to remember, this is a massive, massive ship. It's not like you have the Olympic class liner, which is right here that we're all familiar with. Basically, this one is basically roughly larger, as you can tell by the way that Normandy's stern is actually very much extended. And be honest, as a worker, I would have a very hard time familiarizing myself with this ship real well. If you were a long-time passenger or a long-time crew member on there, you'd have no problem whatsoever. You would be familiar with the ship back to forth. You don't basically have that privilege if you're actually a crew member working on here, basically trying to rebuild this once a popular French vessel into a, a troop carrier. So then on February 6th of 1942, a request for a two-week delay for the first sailing of the Lafayette was actually scheduled for February 14th, was actually submitted to the Assistant Chief of Naval Operation. So at that time, a schedule extension was granted due to the design change whatsoever. So as the superstructure was to be removed to improve stability. So basically, this part of the superstructure was to be removed in work that was expected to take up to three months. But however, on February 7th, orders actually came in from Washington, D.C. that the reduction of the top hamper has been abandoned and the Lafayette was to set sail on February 14th, as planned as normal. So however, this actually caused a frantic resumption of conversion work and Captains Coleman and Simmers actually scheduled meetings in New York and Washington to lobby further clarifications. But however, for us maritime historians, these meetings would never happen whatsoever because an accident was about to take place. Alright guys, I think that's going to uh, pause the timeline for now. Basically, the climax just uh, basically kicked up. We are up actually up on the top of the peak and now we're actually going to go down that climax mountain as well to which that we're going to talk about the disaster and the investigation into the USS Normandy or the USS Lafayette to which we will call from now on in this part so therefore I thank you guys for watching this video and as always stay subscribed like this video comment share with your friends on here and don't worry part four will be out possibly in the new year maybe or earlier but don't worry I will put together this full documentary and basically get it released a lot earlier than usual so thank you guys for watching and I hope to see you in the next one